Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Carrying his own cross, Jesus went out of the city to the place of the skull, or as it is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother, the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed, and to fulfill the scripture perfectly, he said, I thirst. A jar of vinegar stood there, so putting a sponge soaked in the vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, a requiem mass, as I said, is a mass of rest. And so we can entrust those for whom we are praying, the holy souls, to that rest, which is indeed what God promises us in Jesus Christ. Come, you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. So for them, we are doing all we can, especially with the plenary indulgences you might gain today to apply to the holy souls or elsewhere to yourselves. But for us, it's also salutary, of course, at a requiem mass, salutary for us to think of the four last things, of our own death, of our own judgment, of heaven and of hell. It is absolutely consistent with the love of our dear mother in Fatima, a bleeding heart thirsting as it does for the conversion of sinners, and for us also to satisfy something of that thirst by the apostolate we all have for one another in encouraging us to be disciples of Jesus Christ and indeed followers of Mary's perfect example of discipleship. For priests, as you can imagine, we become quite early in ministry familiar with death. I suppose most usually it's not through people we've accompanied, but through funerals and through great sickness in asking to be prayed for in offering mass for the deceased. But of course, one of the great privileges is that we are actually also called to the places where people are dying. And so we do in prayer, spiritually and physically, accompany those who are rapidly approaching death and even die, even as we pray with them. What's that supposed to be like? Well, if Jesus' will were done, if Mary's will were done, that moment of death, in fact, is a very beautiful encounter. St. John of the Cross, one of the great mystics of the church, writes beautifully, lyrically, about the moment of death. He calls it the third veil. Think of the veils over a face. He says the first veil that needs to be broken for us to reach God, our homeland, is the veil of contrition. So we overcome those things which keep us bogged down in sin. Then, of course, the second veil to be taken off, to be lifted, is the veil that we are drawn to God in a life of, uh, well, St. John even calls it divinization, a life of grace, that response to God's call in grace that enables us to lift above ourselves and fall into and walk into a deep discipleship of faithfulness and raising us up to the divine life. We are divinized, as St. John of the Cross teaches. So if those are the first two veils that we must open and walk through, 
What is the third veil? Well, for John of the Cross, he says the third veil is literally that delicate moment of death itself, because we have to break through that for the soul to be wholly free. So he regards it, his, his own words are these, tear through the veil of this sweet encounter. It's a union, it is a consummation, it is a beautiful going to the God whom one loves. And we see that in Jesus himself, we see it in Mary, we see it in St. Paul who longs for the time when he can go to Christ uh, in, without the flesh. We see it in people you have known, too, as they go to their deaths. Cardinal Cormac, when he died last was well, 1st of September, said, I fear nothing, I am wholly at peace. St. Therese is a marvellous example of looking forward to that sweet encounter of going through to death. So that is what it's meant to be if we are faithful to the Lord, who is so totally faithful to us, as is our Blessed Mother then that is a beautiful moment of tearing away the last veil for union. But for many others, of course, it's not like that. And priests often accompany at that moment of death those who are at least intimidated by death and sometimes, alas, frightened. So even when the priest will give the beautiful absolution of the last rites, he will give the apostolic pardon, which is a plenary indulgence at the moment of death. He will give viaticum, if it's possible for someone dying, the food for the journey that we also will receive in the Eucharist. But the moment I find that often can bring a real sense of peace to someone who can hardly speak and whose eyes are wild or frightened is when I pray with them the Hail Mary, and why is that? It's because, of course, they know exactly the words. For however wide of the mark their lives might have been, they will have prayed the Hail Mary. And of course, we come to that climactic line at the end that you and I, in our health, hardly ever think of. But it's that last beautiful line of now and at the hour of our death, amen. Pray she will for us now, and at the hour of our death, amen. And so I remind the person who is there in front of me, possibly intimidated or even frightened by death, I say to them, do you not understand? All through your life, you have asked Our Lady to be with you now and at the hour of our death, amen. There is nothing therefore to be afraid of in Mary's hands when now is the hour of our death. We can let ourselves go into her maternal embrace in full confidence that she will be there for us, praying for us, praying for our conversion of hearts to lift us from this place to the fullness of that life for which she glimpsed to in Jesus and now lives. We are taken through the third veil into the fullness of joy and you can see it in their faces. They recognize that they have prayed that she will be with them at the hour of our death. And so all of a sudden, the hour of that person's death doesn't seem so alien or intimidating at all. It's an hour they've been thinking of each and every time they've said the Hail Mary and sought the company of the Mother of God. And it brings them huge, huge peace and I'm sure a much deeper peace just on the other side of the third veil. How is it, of course, that Our Lady can be such a consolation in such a visceral moment of fear or of love to a person on the brink of death? And the answer, of course, is at the beginning of the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace. Grace that we heard about in that reading from St. Paul. It's an extraordinary thing. The sin, where is it? That uh, where, their, where their sin is death, but wherever the grace will reign. So grace reigns over sin and death. Grace reigns. It is more powerful than sin and death. If we just, of course, turn and ask for that grace, it will be given. 
And so that grace of which Mary is so full, replete and generous as a mediatrix of all graces, she gives us that grace, that gift of God, the expression of his love. Mary walks with us. Think of that beautiful prayer that she gave us in Fatima. Forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of your mercy. You can see from that prayer how much she wants to walk with us, even when we're walking away from her son. Even then, the mother of God will be there as she sort of wept in Fatima at the very fact that souls would be going to hell. She, she calls us back. She seeks us to be companions of people who are, have fallen astray, which is so beautiful to see in the prayers of today. So often we pray for the conversion of sinners. So Mary accompanies us even if we're walking away from Christ. And in that, of course, she, sense, she imitates her son. Think of the encounter at Emmaus, the risen Christ following his disciples when they were going the wrong way. They were going away from all they found in Christ, away from the place of the resurrection, away from their destiny, away from everything that gave them meaning and hope and the purpose of their very lives. He went with them in the wrong direction to bring them home to the peace and the rest that he gave them. And our mother does exactly that. Mother of Fatima, mother of grace in this church, all her beautiful titles as mother of God. We can see too that Our Lady accompanies Jesus in that beautiful gospel I read, even to the foot of the cross. Sometimes one thinks, surely it would be better, less distressing to stay away. But where else would she have been? Where else would she have been except where her son was, even to the point of seeing her son executed on the cross? But if her love is that strong for her son, and her son in that gospel gives Our Lady to each of us as our mother, then our mother will be with us at the foot of every cross in our lives as well. She loves us no less than she loved her son. And in that we have such an extraordinary privilege of grace again, knowing she is there to lift us through the cross if necessary to the place of the third veil being torn apart and union with God. So we are utterly loved by our blessed Lord and by our blessed mother. She will never fail to be close to us because she seeks us to come close to her son. So let us on this day welcome her, of course, into our hearts, ask her for the grace to be her faithful disciple, to be Jesus' faithful disciple, ask her to intercede for all the souls most in need of her mercy, and above all, rejoice that we are a step closer a step closer to the intimacy and the ecstasy of the lifting of the third veil that we might bring a life of fruitfulness in grace to its fullness in the divine life of heaven. May those holy souls rest in peace. Amen. Amen.